Story time with Jesus continues this Sunday in Luke chapter 16. So let me invite you to join me in your Bible and your copy of God's Word. Luke chapter 16 beginning in verse 1 and I'm going to read through verse 9. Luke 16 verses 1 through 9. Now you need to put on your thinking cap. You need to sharpen your thinking pencil because you're going to need both. What on earth is Jesus teaching us in this parable in Luke chapter 16 as we read verses 1 through 9? Now, he said to the disciples, there was a rich man who received an accusation that his manager was squandering his possessions. So he called the manager in and asked, What is this I hear about you? Give an account of your management, because you can no longer be manager. Then the manager said to himself, What will I do since my master is taking the management away from me? I'm not strong enough to dig. I'm ashamed to beg. I know what I'll do so that when I'm removed from my management, people will welcome me into their homes. So he summoned each one of his master's debtors. How much do you owe my master? He asked the first one. A hundred measures of olive oil, he said. Take your invoice, he told him. Sit down quickly and write 50. Next, he asked another, how much do you owe? A hundred measures of wheat, he said. Take your invoice, he told him, and write 80. The master praised the unrighteous manager because he had acted shrewdly. For the children of this age are more shrewd than the children of light in dealing with their own people. And I tell you, make friends for yourselves by means of worldly wealth so that when it fails, they may welcome you into eternal dwellings. When you read that parable, your first response may be like my first response, a single word. What? 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 Lord, what in the world are you talking about? This parable, called traditionally the parable of the unjust steward, but that name is way too tame. No, this is really the parable of the shrewd CFO. The shrewd, the parable of the shrewd business manager. Interestingly, this parable, because it is so weird, so different, so unique, has has become a parable that has suffered at the hands of the Lord's friends and the Lord's enemies. The 4th century emperor Julian, who was called Julian the Apostate, took this parable and used it to say to Roman, the people of Rome and the Roman Empire that look at what Jesus taught. Jesus said that you ought to be a cheat and a liar and a scoundrel, and no true Roman would ever follow anybody like that. Julian used this parable against the Christians of his day. Well, Christians also, preachers for example, many times you'll hear a pastor will do like what I'm doing, he'll do a series of sermons on the parables. But seldom will you hear a sermon on this parable because preachers skip it. They're not sure what to do with it. They're not sure how to deal with it. And so they just skip it because of its difficulty. This parable suffers at the hands of Jesus' friends and at the hands of his enemies. I would title my sermon today in two words, You're Fired. That's the message. That's the title of the sermon. I borrow that from Vince McMahon, who many of you will remember was the CEO of World Res Wrestling Entertainment, WWE. And in days gone by, he coined that phrase. He became famous for that phrase, you're fired. 
later in 2003, Donald Trump would become famous for that use of that phrase in The Apprentice. And then in 2007, Celebrity Apprentice would actually copyright that phrase so that they could use it and no one else the phrase, you're fired aptly summarizes this particular parable. Did you notice where this parable is located in Luke's gospel? Did you notice that it occurs right after Jesus' parable of the prodigal son, which we looked at last week? By the way, you do know, do you not, that the chapter divisions in the Bible are not original uh, when the Bible was originally written in Greek. The chapter divisions were not there. In fact, can you tell me who put them there and when? If you can, I'll buy you a steak dinner. Anybody? Anybody tell me when and where? Who did it? Okay, I guess I'm safe. Stephen Langton in the 13th century is the man that you owe a debt of gratitude for going through your Bible and creating the chapter divisions. And then two centuries later, Robert Stephanus put in the verses in your Bible, identified all of the verses so that you would be able to quickly find a text of Scripture on Sunday morning when the preacher stands up and says, turn to Luke chapter 16. Otherwise, he would have to say, you know, over there in the Gospel of Luke, kind of about halfway through, and it's right after the story of the parable of the prodigal son. Oh, oh yeah, we flipped through there. How difficult that would be if you didn't have chapter and verse divisions. But we do have chapter and verse divisions. And notice... The chapter 16 begins right after the parable of the prodigal son. Now I wonder why did Luke juxtapose these two parables? Well, when you look through the parable of the prodigal son and the parable of the shrewd CFO, the chief financial officer, the business manager, there are at least seven parallels. Both begin with the very same words, a certain man. Both convey a crisis situation. Both contain the word squander and the fact that he, one individual is squandering the resources of another individual. Both come to a moment of truth. Both seek relief from a crisis. And both receive an unexpected answer from the person they have wronged. There are seven parallels. Now there are one or two others. I want to see if you can figure it out, what the connection of this parable is to the parable of the prodigal son by the time we get to the end. It's a simple story. It's the world of big business. All of those of you, who have, many of you are retired, so you've been in business in the past, and many of you are working now, so you are in business. And the story is pictured in the background of the world of big business. A manager, a CFO of the corporation, the chief financial officer, has ripped off his boss. He's ripped off his owner for a lot of money, and he's gotten caught. You see, the CFO, or in this case, the steward, or the better translation, the business manager, was responsible for all of the accounts of his boss. His boss was a landowner. Many people farmed out his land, and there was a certain amount of the, of the produce of the land that they would have to return to the landowner and then keep the difference themselves to be able to sell and make a living. And so all of these are debtors to the landowner, and the business manager is the man who keeps the books. Rent was paid in produce of the land to the landowner through the CFO, through the business manager. But the business manager was crooked. What did he do? He tampered with the books. He cooked the books. He had his hands deep into the pockets of his boss, and he was lining his own pockets as he was stealing from his boss and putting it all somewhere in a Swiss bank account. Well, in this story, probably a Syrian bank account, which might be a little closer to Israel there. He's pilfered. He's a crook. He's a scoundrel. He's a scallywag. He's a cheat. Cheat. 
He's bilking money out of the corporation in order to line his own pockets. Well, word of his thievery came to the business owner. And notice what is stated there in verse 2. He called that manager in and says, What's this I hear about you? Now, it's very interesting that little phrase, I hear about you, is couched in the language in a way that indicates the business owner received a negative report of criticism about his CFO. And so apparently, having investigated it, before he called him in, he found out it is indeed true. My business manager, my number two, my CFO, is stealing from me. <laughs> and so he calls him in, and he confronts him, and he says, give an account of your management because you are no longer my manager. To put that in common English, you're fired. On the spot, right now, and not only that, there's about to be an audit. Don't you just love an audit when you get audited? Don't you love that? I don't think it's probably been maybe 25 years ago now. I messed up on my income taxes, and I got a notice from the IRS that you're being audited. Boy, I want you to know that was the most fun when I went down to that auditor's office and sat there for two hours as she went through every nook and cranny of all of my finances, and it wound up costing me about $3,000 more because of the dumb mistakes that I made when I did my own taxes in those days. Don't you just love it when you're getting audited, right? And so here's the CFO. He's being fired, and he says there's about to be an audit. Turn in your office keys, turn in the company camel, turn in your computer, because you're fired. So what's he going to do? Verse 3, now comes the little soliloquy. The manager says to himself, well, well where have I heard that before in the previous parable? The prodigal son came to himself and then talked to himself. Very interesting. Then the manager said to himself, What will I do since my master is taking the management away from me? In other words, put that in common English, What am I going to do now that I'm fired? He's worried about his future. This is a lucrative job. I mean, this is the best place you can be. Man, you've got the cush job. You're number two. You're vice president. You're the CFO. This is, comes with a big salary. I mean, you, there aren't many places to go from here. And I wondered, was he married? Did he have a wife? Did he have kids in college? And all of a sudden, he sees all of that now. All of the bank accounts gone. He's in major, mega trouble. What in the world is he going to do? Can I keep my spacious home? What about my 5G iPhone? I'm not, will I be able to hold on to that? How will I pay for my kids' college? How am I going to handle all of this situation? My goodness, it's going to slip away. But yet, in the midst of it all, shrewd, clever character that he is, he finagles away in a self-serving way to, on his way out the door, cheat his boss once again. Notice he says, I've got to do something. He says, uh, notice this in verse 3, I'm not strong enough to dig and I'm ashamed to beg. The only other two options left to him for employment would be, number one, to go from a white-collar job to a blue-collar job of digging ditches for 12 hours a day. And he says, my hands are too soft for that. I haven't had calluses in years. I can't do that. I don't want to do that. And then he says, at my station in life, I don't want to go to beg on the street corner. I don't want to be one of those guys or one of those ladies standing out there on Beltline over here with a sign that says, you know, help wanted, help needed, you know, uh, you know, give me some food or whatever. I don't want to do that. I'm too proud to do that. What in the world am I going to do? Can't you see him? Can't you see him in your mind's eye out there? He's the Grinch nervously drumming his desk with his fingers. Can't you hear him? Nervously drumming, thinking, what in the world am I going to do? 
And then suddenly it comes to him. Eureka! He has a brilliant idea. He thinks to himself, I still have an ace in the hole. I'm the guy who knows when to hold them and knows when to fold them, and this is a time for me to strike. I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to risk everything on the roll of the dice. And so what does he do? Verse 4, he says, I'm going to do something. I'm going to concoct a dishonest scheme so that when I am removed, when I'm fired, as I have to vacate the office, and if I have to sell my home or if I lose my home to the creditors or whatever the case, look at that last statement in verse 4, people will welcome me into their homes. And so what in the world is he going to do? Caught in the act of squandering and stealing his boss's money, and being caught in that act, he devises a brilliant scheme. He decides to call in the business owner's debtors and cut a deal with each one of them. And so we read about it. Look at it in verse 5. So he summoned each one of his master's debtors. How much do you owe my master? He asked the first one. A hundred measures of olive oil. Now remember, culturally, and in the business world of the first century, the agent of a business owner could act for the business owner. And every one of the debtors out there, all of the customers, understood that when the agent of the owner came to them, that was like the owner coming to them in that day, in that culture, in the commerce and business world of the day. Now, his creditors at this point, or the, the customers at this point, did not know the business manager had been fired. They had no news of that. That's why the word quickly occurs. Now, quickly, quickly do this, quickly do that. They've not heard the news that he's been fired. And so he's going to build on that in order to cheat the owner once again. And so what does he do? Well, how much do you owe? He asked the first one. And he said, well, a hundred measures of oil. A hundred measures of oil is equal to 900 gallons. To produce a hundred, to produce a hundred measures or 900 gallons, the value of that in Jesus' day was three years income, three years pay. It would take you three years to achieve 900 gallons over that three-year period. That would cost you or cost somebody or be valued at three years worth of wages. And so what does he say? A hundred measures of oil, that's what I owe. Take your invoice, the business manager told him. Sit down quickly and write 50. Now watch it. Who's doing the right? Who's changing the contract? Remember, he had already turned in his computer, but what did he do? He kept a hard drive, an, an external hard drive, so he's got all those accounts, right? So how much do you owe? Okay, take this, alter the account with your handwriting, and say, instead of owing 100, I'm going to owe you 50. Next, he asked another one, verse 7, the next creditor, how much do you owe? 100 measures of wheat, he said. A hundred measures of wheat is 1,100 bushels of wheat. That is enough wheat that would be drawn from 100 acres, and it would feed 150 people for an entire year. The value of that wheat was equivalent to working for seven years. You would have to pay seven years' worth of income to have that much wheat. And so what does he tell him to do? He says, take your invoice, and he told him, write out 80. Now, immediately you read this, and you say, wait a minute now, you've got a sort of a 50% reduction there in verse 6, but in verse 7 you got a 20% reduction. So what's going on? Why didn't he just do 50 across the board? Because you have to understand the difference between the commodities of oil and wheat. The risk factor in business 
of producing the oil was much greater than the risk factor of the wheat. And so there's a 50% risk factor that's factored in and a 20% only for the wheat. And that's the reason for the difference. So he's very shrewd. He's very calculating. He knows exactly what he's doing. He understands business. He understands the stock market. He understands his boss. He understands the needs of the customers. And shrewd dude that he is, he's going to feather his own nest on his way out the door by stealing once again from his employer. It's astounding, isn't it? So quickly, quickly, write this up. Write this out. Change the account. Now, what will be the attitude of each of these customers toward now the CFO? Oh, my, you're my new best friend. <laughs> I mean, you know what this is the equivalent of? This is the equivalent of you getting a, a letter in the mail from your credit card company. Visa sends you a letter. MasterCard sends you a letter. You open your mail tomorrow, and in the letter it says... Uh, greetings, uh, we want you to know that your current balance is $10,000. But as of today, we're cutting your balance by $5,000. Forget about paying back the $10,000. You only need to pay us back five. dollars What would you do? Why, you'd be dancing around the living room. Why, you'd be thrilled. My goodness, I owe 10000 10, to Visa, but they're just, they're just cutting. They're throwing away 5000 They're just letting me pay them back. 5000 only. Why, Visa would become your new best friend. And that's what's happening here. It's exactly what's happening here. Now, furthermore, in the first century, there was what was known in the business world and in the culture generally as the concept of reciprocity. And what that means is this, if I do something really nice for you, it is expected that when I'm in need, you will reciprocate and do something really nice for me. And so based on that culture, the CFO is depending on the customers of his boss being ingratiated to him in such a way that when he falls on hard times down the road, if he loses his house and loses his shirt, he'll have some friends who will take him in. Just the opposite of the prodigal son who when he lost everything had no friends to take him in. But I digress. And so one day, the business owner is in his plush office, and his email starts blowing up. Thank you, sir, for your kindness. I can't believe that you would cut my bill by 50%. Thank you, sir, for your goodness. I am so grateful that you cut my bill by 20%. And these emails come flying in, and he begins to think, what? What in the world is happening? And then he discovers what has been happening. His fired CFO has continued to finagle in such a way that he has created a situation for the owner that it will be very difficult for him to get out of. You see, once you've received official notification from Visa that we're cutting your what you owe, you owe 10000 but we're cutting it to five. Once you receive that from Visa, it's going to be pretty difficult for them to go back on their word. So now the owner who realizes, my goodness, I've been cheated. I've been cheated again by that scoundrel, that thief. It's next to impossible for him now to go back and undo, say, sorry, all my customers, I'm sorry. He had no authority to do that. Actually, you owe the full amount. His name would be mud if he did that. So the shrewd manager has feathered his own nest by plucking his boss is essentially what's happened. He took material 
things, money, took material things of value, and by a strange magic, he converted that into friends, new friends, who will help him out when he needs to be helped out. He made out of it grateful hearts who were prepared to help him whenever his time of need came around as he thought in his scheme. <laughs> when I think about what this guy did, I mean, this is like the cartoon Tom and Jerry. You know, Tom the cat's always trying to get Jerry, but Jerry's always shrewdly turning the tables, and Tom always loses. This, this is the Roadrunner and Wiley Coyote. Wiley Coyote thinks he's going to get the Roadrunner, but the Roadrunner is shrewd, and he's always turning the tables. And when the bird seed is there, and the acme safe held by the rope is there, and the Roadrunner comes and eats and then takes off, and he can't get the rope to cut and fall, and so he's frustrated, and the Wiley Coyote goes over, looks down at the bird seed, and then suddenly the rope snaps, and the safe falls, and crunch, and he's dead until the next cartoon that's what's happening here the owner praises him praises the dishonest business manager that's what's shocking verse 8 the master praised the unrighteous manager at first he was angry that dirty rotten scoundrel cheated me once again. What gall? But then as he reflected on it, a thin smile would come across his face. I can just hear him say laughingly, can't you? Son, you beat everything. You know that? Why, you are quite a character. I'm amazed at what you've done. You've ingratiated me to my customers in such a way that I can't undo what you've done without losing face and at the same time you feathered your own nest and taken care of you why once you're now that you're fired and you're gone one or two of them will probably take you into their employment you are a shrewd dude you are a cunning character the owner praises the dishonest CFO <laughs> you know what it would be like it would be like a burglar breaks into your house tonight and you catch him and you've got your Glock 19, right? You pull it out of the drawer by your bed, you hear a noise, you go in there and you catch him. He's broken into your home, he's stealing your silverware and other stuff and you get the drop on him and he puts his hands up, right? And then you praise him for his ability at picking locks. You know, you're pretty good. You got in my house. You're a pretty good lock, lock picker. It's unexpected. It's not what you would normally do or think or say. And yet in the midst of this situation in Jesus' story, he says the business owner praises the dishonest CFO. Well, you are skilled in public relations. You are a man of ingenuity and strategic planning. <laughs> you live by your wits. You've got street smarts. You used your shrewdness and the situation to take care of yourself. And so he praised him. Now watch it. This is very, very important. Mark this down. You've got your thinking cap on. You've got your pencil, thinking pencil sharpened. All right, here you go. There is a big difference in saying, I applaud the clever steward because he acted dishonestly, and saying, I applaud the dishonest CFO because he acted shrewdly. It's the latter that Jesus is doing. Make no mistake. Jesus is not praising dishonesty. Jesus is in no way commending his, the former employee, the CFO, the business manager, for being crooked. Jesus is not doing that at all. In the parable, Jesus is telling the story of the owner who praises 
the shrewdness of the crooked business manager. He is commending him and praising him because he acted cleverly and shrewdly. Are you with me? Now, verse 9. Or, I'm sorry, the rest of verse 8. Jesus says, For the children of this age are more shrewd than the children of light in dealing with their own people. Now again, what? What in the world is Jesus talking about? The phrase, children of this age, is a reference to people who do not know Christ. It is a reference to all people who are not followers of Jesus, all non-Christians, all who are unsaved. They are the children of this age. The children of light is a phrase that refers to all believers, all Christians, all true followers of Jesus. So notice that Jesus says there are two groups of people. Jesus says, you're either with me or you're not with me. You're either the children of this age or you're the children of light. You're either saved or you're unsaved. It's one or the other. And notice what Jesus says in the parable. He says that the children of this age, like the the business manager, the unrighteous business man, the crooked business manager, the cheating business manager, those people in the world, watch it, are more shrewd than Christians in the world. Now think, this is going somewhere, Jesus is going somewhere, think, they are more shrewd than the children of light with their own people. They're more shrewd with how they deal in the business world, how they cut corners, how they connive, how they cheat, how they work the, 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 the system, how they get 20% more when it's not there, how they sell it for 20% more when they should only be selling it for 10% more, and how they trick and cheat and how they do what they do. They are much better, they're more shrewd in what they do in the world than Christians are in how they live their Christian life. Mm. Jesus continues. Verse 9. And I tell you, now here comes the point. And I tell you, make friends for yourselves by means of worldly wealth, so that when it fails, they may welcome you into eternal dwellings. Again, jaw on the floor. Can't believe I heard Jesus say this. We respond with a single word. What? What in the world, Jesus, are you saying? Well, number one, notice the text there in verse 9 make friends by means of worldly wealth. That's the word, the old translation there is the word mammon, common word in the, old, in the Bible for wealth, worldly wealth. And it is basically here just a stock phrase for worldly wealth, which is sometimes gained in ungodly ways, sometimes gained by cheating. You remember the old King James Version we were first introduced to the phrase in the King James Version, filthy lucre. You remember that phrase? Seldom do you ever hear it used today, filthy lucre. You know where it first came? William Tyndale, the first person who translated in the 16th century who translated the Bible into English. There in England, William Tyndale used that phrase for the Greek word for dishonest gain in the Greek New Testament. He used the phrase filthy lucre. And from the middle 16th century on through today, filthy lucre is somewhat of a stock term that means income gain dishonestly. Right? It's sort of like it's Ebenezer Scrooge, the shrewd businessman. It's Mr. Potter in It's a Wonderful Life with Jimmy Stewart. 
It's Vito Corleone in The Godfather. This is the kind of shrewdness that the business owner praises his thieving, conniving CFO who stole from him and praising him for his shrewdness. The filthy lucre. And then Jesus says, look at it in verse 9. Make friends for yourselves. In other words, convert this bad situation into your ally. Take all this money that you're cutting from the bills of all my customers, right? And we're going to and they're going to be your friend now because you've done that. My, you're you're a friend for life. And so down the road, when you're out of a job, once everything closes and your bank account runs out and they come and take your house, you can go live with them. You can get a job with them. You have made friends of, and you've used that money falsely, dishonestly, in order to secure your own future well-being. That's what the business manager is being praised for his shrewdness. So that they will enter, bring you into eternal dwellings. Now Jesus looks to the end of all of our lives. And in the end of it all, everybody is going to one of two dwellings, one of two eternal dwellings. You're either going to hell or you're going to heaven. There aren't any other places, there aren't any other options. You're going to live in one of two places. You do understand that. Every person listening to me right now, every person online listening to me right now, your final destiny, your final home, right, in eternity is one of two places. Not three, not five options, two. And you're either going to be living in hell if you don't know Christ and reject Him, or if you believe in Jesus and trust Him for the forgiveness of your sins, you're going to live in heaven. You're going to live there. And what Jesus is saying is this. Make sure that you put yourself in a position through your use of money, money which can easily lead you astray, money which can keep you from me, money which can become your idol. If you misuse it, don't do that. Use it wisely for my purposes and my kingdom so that when it's all said and done, you are welcomed into your eternal dwelling. Now be careful. Time out. Watch it. Hold the phone. Not because you acted shrewdly to get saved. That's not how it works. Salvation is by grace through faith alone. Nobody is saved in any other way. So it has nothing to do with that. Now the issue is what you do when you are a believer with everything you have such that you commit all of your resources, your time, your money, yourself to thinking through how can I use this for kingdom purposes, for God's kingdom purposes? How can I use every penny of everything that I have in such a way. This is not a parable about dishonesty, ultimately. It's not a parable about misusing money, ultimately. No, it is a parable about the importance of Christians being shrewd in making the most of their resources to put them in the hands of the king. Listen, there is not a square inch of your life that Jesus doesn't say over it, mine. Everything you are, everything you have, everything you will be, everything you possess now or will possess in the future, if you are a Christian, it belongs to Him. And what Jesus is saying to you and me is be shrewd in your Christian life like the people who aren't going anywhere, the people who don't know me, the people who are going to make all the money in the world, all of the unsaved people out there who are going to become head of the company and they're going to feather their nest and they're going to provide for their kids' college, but in the end they're going to die and go to hell. It's going to be a dead end because money will never get you anywhere. So now Jesus said, those of you who know me, why don't you be shrewd in my business? My business is bringing lost people to me. My business is getting the unsaved saved. My business is growing, not your business, 
but growing my kingdom. That's what Jesus is saying. And Jesus is saying, take everything you have and are and put it into use for his kingdom. Think shrewdly. The world as good is good at doing things in a worldly way. Christians aren't good at doing things in a Christian way. Did you hear what I said? The world is brilliant at doing things in their ungodly, worldly way. Christians are not so good at doing things in a Christian way. The shrewd manager outsmarted the world with his worldliness. You and I need to outsmart the world with our godliness. And by the way, that's the only way to outsmart the world. You think you're going to outsmart the world in any other way apart from Christian principles and godly living? You are sorely mistaken. You want to outsmart the devil? You want to outsmart the world? Then do it God's way. Put all of your resources at his disposal and say, this is all about you, Lord. How can I do whatever you need done for your kingdom's work? How would the world's duplicity and deceptiveness compare to your dedication and devotion? The world is much better at duplicity than Christians are at integrity. The business manager, the crooked business manager, subordinated everything to making him number one. Jesus is saying Christians need to subordinate everything to making him number one and bringing people to him. Here's the point. Put your money in motion for the master. Put your money in motion for the master. And how can you do that? Think through that. How would that look? What would that look like? Are you just theoretically committed when you come to church and sing these songs and listen to this sermon? Are you and I just theoretically committed to the things of Jesus? that he is all in all, that we give our all to him? Or do we really mean that and are willing to put that into practice when we talk about it? Oh, if businessmen ran their businesses like some of you run your Christian life, they would be bankrupt. So Jesus says, get with it. The world is full of shrewd dudes. Why don't you be shrewd spiritually? Why don't you be shrewd godly? Why don't you be a shrewd Christian? This is the point of the parable. Make your life and your contents count, your, your resources count for the kingdom. And think through ways that you can do that. Well, well, David, I, I'm already doing that. I'm a tither at my church. Good. I, and I'm trying to make my business honor Christ. Good. And I'm trying to honor Jesus in my home. Wonderful. Now, let's go beyond that. Go on top of that. And let's think, let's think creatively. And let's think shrewdly. How can we continue to do that and build and build and build on that? What's the purpose for our fireworks display tonight? What is the purpose of our fireworks display tonight? Oh, well, the purpose of our fireworks display uh, is so we can all get together and have fellowship. No, that's not the purpose. That's a byproduct. What's the purpose of our fireworks display? Well, we're, we're, we're celebrating one week early because Sunday is July 4th. Next Sunday, we can't do it on that night. So we're doing it tonight. We're celebrating our independence. No, that's not the purpose. That's true, but that's a byproduct. What's the purpose of what we're doing tonight? Think shrewdly. What's the purpose of what we're doing? 
We're inviting the community to an event that we are sponsoring, we're investing in, we're paying for it. They don't pay a dime. They come, and then the goal is so that we might have opportunities to introduce them not just to our church, but to introduce them to our Savior. That's the purpose of it. That's why we do what we do. And it's just that kind of thing times 10 to the 10th power that we need to think about, number one, as a church, number two, as individual Christians. I've been thinking about this in my life and in Kate and I's marriage and how we can do better than what we're doing, how we can put money in motion for the master. We put our lives and our resources, and, and she and I are going to have some conversations about this because we're already doing some things, but this parable says, David, are you doing everything you can do? I'm not sure I am. The children of this world are more shrewd than the children of light. And they are so dumb, they don't even know that everything they're doing is coming to an end and they're going to end up in a land of darkness in a place called hell for all eternity. All of their money, all their ingenuity, that's where it's headed. It's headed nowhere. But we who are Christians, who know the truth, who know Christ, who have an eternal destiny in home, at, in heaven, regardless of whether we make a ton of money in this life or make just very little, either way, our eternal destiny is the mansion of God in heaven for all eternity. That's who we are. We're children of light. So now think like it, live like it. How can I take what I have and who I am and put it in the disposal, to the disposal, and in the hands of the king. Two questions say it all. What are you doing it for? Question number one, what are you doing it for? Question number two, suppose you get it, what then? You make all the money you want to make. Okay, what then? You get the dream house, vacation home on the beach. What then? What are you doing it for? And suppose you get it, what then? Those are the questions that Jesus, in story time, asks us to consider today. 